Welcome to episode 222 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Steve Deering. Steve reads screenplays for the SYS Script Analysis Service, and he just optioned a screenplay through the new SYS Select database. He's been reading screenplays for various companies for many, many years, so he's got some great insight into what works and what doesn't work in a screenplay. And of course, we also talk about how he got this option through the new SYS Select database. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this out episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode number 222. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. And now I have a special segment. You may have noticed over the last couple of years, this podcast has been getting published over at LAScreenwriter.com, which is run by Angela Barissa. LA Screenwriter is co-sponsoring a new screenwriting competition, and I wanted to have Angela on to give us a quick overview of what that's all about. So here she is with a quick description of both LA Screenwriter and the new screenplay competition called Write LA. Here is Angela. Welcome, Angela, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. Thanks for coming on the show and talking with me today. Thanks for having me, Ashley. So maybe you can just give us a quick overview of your background, kind of where did you grow up and how did you get started in the entertainment industry? Sure. I um, I grew up in Orange County. I'm a SoCal girl. Um, and then I went to UCLA. So um, that was my big entry to the film world. Obviously, that's the center of everything. Um, yeah, I, I got interested in screenwriting way back in middle school. I did a playwriting, you know, little program at my middle school, and uh, that's when I fell in love with writing dialogue, which was my connection to screenwriting. I thought that was the best part of it, and I still do, honestly. Um, but yeah, I, I started um, writing in college, and I've been writing ever since. Okay, perfect. And I'm sure many of my listeners are familiar with your blog, which is la-screenwriter.com. Maybe you can just <laughs> quickly tell us what your blog is all about. Sure. Yeah, I started that seven years ago now, and it really started as a way for me to start, you know, really focusing my screenwriting craft and trying to learn from people that was out there. So I just started collecting articles that I found useful and scripts that I wanted to read um, and put them in this, you know, central location. And it's just grown and grown and grown over the years. And now we get, you know, between like 3,000 and 4,000 hits a day, people seem to have really taken to it. So okay. I'm definitely very proud of it. Yeah, perfect. And I'm curious, um, with your goals, it sounds like part of your, your idea for starting was really just your own self-education and hopefully other people can benefit from that too. Um, have you mm -hmm. found that that's to be true? Have you been able to network with people? Have you been able to you know educate, be more educated, work on your own craft? Maybe you can talk about some of the benefits you've gotten out of running LA Screenwriter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a great way for me just one, to just focus myself and make sure that I'm, I'm reading scripts regularly and, you know, seeing what's out there. Um, but two, it's been a great way to connect with working writers who I otherwise wouldn't have really had a, you know, a good opportunity to, like, be a resource for. Like, they connect with me because they want to, you know, maybe write something for the site or do an interview. Um, so it, it's made me someone that people want to connect with, um, which has been really great for me to, you know, um, make myself, you know, someone that is, you know, someone that these people want to talk to. Um, so it's helped me really build my network. Um, but it's also been really great just seeing other writers like myself benefit, you know, from just the resources that we've brought together on the site. It's really rewarding seeing how people, you know, really enjoy what's up there and you know, feel like they're becoming better writers based on what they're reading. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So you're now involved in a new screenwriting contest um, called Write LA. Um, maybe, you, and that's at write-la.com. And I will link to all this stuff in the show notes so people can easily find it. Um, maybe you can tell us what that's all about. What's, um, what is that screenwriting contest? 
Sure. So this is a contest, new contest that we have launched um, in partnership with Live Read LA, and that's LiveRead LA dot com. Excuse me. Um, they do a six week, every six weeks contest. That's um, kind of a smaller version of what we're now doing as an annual competition. Um, and in their smaller contest, you can enter thirty pages, and you know the big prize at the end of the contest is um, two winners get to hear those 30 pages read live on stage in LA hmm. um, with professional actors reading the parts. So what we've done is just taken that idea and kind of blown it up. So now we're offering a prize to three grand prize winners. We're going to fly them out to LA, give them kind of the industry experience, but also do a private screenwriting lab with those writers where they're going to get private classes for two days led by Tim Schildberger, who is the person behind Live Read LA. Um, well, we'll bring in actors, we'll do writing exercises, we'll just really try and help them hone their winning scripts, but also just their craft in general. Um, and then at the end of the whole experience, we're doing a live read event where we're doing a private invite-only gala where people will get to hear these these winning scripts read live on stage. So we, you know, we're really trying to, one, celebrate these writers, but also give them the tools that they need to really launch a career, mm -hmm. which I think is something that lots of contests are kind of missing these days. Like they kind of claim, oh, we'll just have your big break, but they don't really like give you the tools to help you get there yourself. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay, perfect. And is there any specific type of screenwriter that you think is a perfect fit for this? Um, like some contests have a rule that you can't have sold a script, so you can't be a produced writer or something. And and maybe there's others concentrate on a particular genre or something like that. Is there anything sure. like that that you're looking for in the scripts and in the writers? Sure. We don't have any genre restrictions. Um, you just can't have sold or optioned the script that you enter, but you can be a produced writer. That's fine. Um, really, we just want, you know, standout stories. We're looking for great characters and, you know, great plots. We want things that we feel like um, show a lot of skill for a writer who isn't just, you know, a one hit wonder, but has a chance to have a real career, you know, so that's that's what we're looking for. It doesn't matter. TV, film, both are welcome. We just want great stories, really. Okay. Well, perfect, Angela. I appreciate you coming on and telling um, the listeners all about that. And as I said, I'll definitely round up those links and put them in the show notes. And I wish you well with the, um, the website and um, the contest. Thanks. Oh, and just to mention, our first deadline is April 30th. That's the early bird. So okay. get in by then if you can. Perfect. Yep, yep. And this will be published yeah, before April 30th. So yeah, definitely get in. You can save a little bit of money with that early bird deadline. So thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, Ashley. So I will link to all of that in the show notes, both LA Screenwriter and Write LA. Definitely check it out. I mean, lascreenwriter.com. It's a free blog. There's lots of useful information, lots of great articles. Obviously, my own podcast is published there, but there's a lot of other contributors to the site. So I would highly encourage you to check that out if you have some time. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I'm interviewing screenwriter Steve Deering. Here is the interview. Welcome, Steve, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So let's start out by talking about the recent option you had through the new SYS Select Screenplay database. First, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that project. What's the log line for that script? Sure thing. Uh, the log line, it's a fantasy adventure called Otherworld. And the log line is, on Halloween night, a troubled young woman slips through the cracks of reality and finds herself in a mystical realm inspired by the myths and legends of the Celtic Otherworld. Teaming up with an unlikely group of companions, including a ferryman, a trickster, and a headless horseman, she struggles to find her way home and evade the clutches of the Morrigan, Otherworld's terrifying ruler that's determined to cross over to the real world, no matter the cost. Perfect. And I'm curious, with, with a pitch like this, um, do you try and compare it to some successful movies, Lord of the Rings or something like that? I mean, it has that sort of fantasy quest element. Um, how do you go about pitching something like this? Oh, definitely. I, I call it um, a fantastical adventure, reminiscent, highly reminiscent of The Wizard of Oz, The Chronicles of Narnia, but with a contemporary twist, mostly through dialogue. I'm definitely taking the archetypal like idea of a journey through like a magical land and it's very much adheres to that kind of archetypal journey but i found that i was trying to differentiate it through just you know modern dialogue snappy dialogue um, fun relatable characterizations even if these are like mythological figures okay perfect and where did this idea come from what was sort of the genesis of it um a form of research. I, I like to watch a lot of um, documentaries on, you know, religions, uh, theology, mythology, <clears throat> even, you know, 
uh, cryptozoology, just all those kind of odd documentaries. I, I watched them a lot before going to bed. And I was watching one one night, and um, it was just a documentary on the Celtic Otherworld. And, and to be honest, the title is the first thing that struck me. I was just like, oh, Otherworld, that's, that's just a great title and just a great concept of this realm of, like, you know, forgotten gods and creatures because the Celtic, you know, mythology mm-hmm. is not as well preserved as others. It's very ancient, and it's kind of a lot of the exact characterizations of these figures has fallen away. So I just thought it was something that was ripe for exploration, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. I just like to keep my eyes open. Anytime you're watching a show, it's good to just think like, oh, is this a good idea? Is this a movie? Is this, could this be something? Yeah. So let's talk about some of sort of the, just the practical aspects of this new um, database that I've created. Um, first off, how many scripts do you have listed in the database? Obviously, this one is optioned. How many other scripts do you list? I just have two in there at the moment, but I'm working on polishing some additional ones because my experiences so far with the system have been fantastic. So I'm trying to bring some of my other works up to a similar level of quality and get them ready to enter in the system as well. But as of now, just two. Okay. And how do you decide that these other scripts are not up to the same quality standards as these two that are listed? Um, It mostly just comes down to how much time I've spent with them, you know? Um, Every writer, I think, should feel out their rewrite process and, and exactly what what point they feel like it's ready for other people to read. Um, the, the script Otherworld, it kind of has a Halloween kind of, you know, aspect to it. Um, so I've, I've actually worked on it the past, like, two or three years every time around Halloween as a fun little tradition for myself, turning the writing process into, like, you know, kind of a fun little, you know, uh, routine. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've kind of hit that one a couple times and, and sent it in to various companies for feedback, knocked out the feedback and, and the more that I get it reviewed and looked at. And when it comes back to me, the less criticisms there are, the more I start to realize that I've ironed out those, those wrinkles. Whereas some of my older scripts, I haven't given them that attention. I've kind of written it one time through, looked at it, called it a complete story and happily shelved it away for the time. And you know, once something's written, that's just the first draft. Like, I, I suppose I've just given these versions more drafts and some of the other scripts, I feel, just still need that additional attention. Yeah, sure. Um, that all makes sense. So I'm curious, what did you put down as the budget? Um, that's one of the one of the things when you upload the script to, this, to the Selling Your Screenplay script database, you choose like a genre and you choose a budget range. What kind of budget range did you give this script? Oh, gosh, I, I kind of forget what I marked down the budget as, but it was... Um, I think the highest but budget is, now, 10 plus, is 10 million or more, I think is the highest one that we have in there. I think I put in a, between 5 to 10 million as my own kind of budget estimation because it is kind of a, a huge spectacle-filled story. But um, the producer that optioned the script is looking to kind of package and finance it around 3 million. So... I've seen some of the special effects companies he has in mind for this, and I think um, he absolutely has the right approach. So I might have even overestimated the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to see that a producer has been able to look at it objectively and rein in the budget to something that sounds very doable. Yeah. So um, you've had these two scripts listed now for coming up on probably two months since that's when we launched the the database. Do you know how many um, logline views you've gotten for these two scripts? I believe I've gotten 20 and then just one singular download itself for Otherworld. But mm-hmm. the the singular download uh, resulted in an option, so no complaints here. Yeah, yeah, sure. And what are the differences between the two scripts? Is the other one also a sort of fantasy adventure, higher budget fantasy adventure? Or is the other script something different? Oh, the, the other script is wildly different. It's one of the first things I wrote, although I've given it some layers of polish. Um, it's, it's basically... Uh, a, a, a fat camp full of um, uh, kids who are working to get in shape and it's, it's taken over. It's basically he- Disney's heavyweights meets invasion of the body snatchers mm-hmm. where it's kind of an alien invasion story taking place at a fat camp. The, the log line sounds a little kind of jarring where you're like, Oh, is it mean spirited? But I've actually tried to like infuse it with a lot of themes about what identity means, what it means to be your hero. You don't have to look or be a certain way to be a good person or a hero. And so I find it kind of like a charming little story, even though it's kind of a splatterfest um, 
horror comedy. Okay. And um, what other services have you tried? Contests, any of the other services? Have you tried promoting these scripts using any of these other services or contests or anything? I haven't dug too deeply into the realms of contests as of yet, just because of my own, you know, budgetary limitations and financial things. But um, I, I have been looking more and more into it because I have a writer I've worked with in the past that has recently had great success winning a contest. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of just familiarizing myself with all these contests and what are considered the best ones. I mostly just dig in and perform kind of just manual marketing where I kind of research companies that might be a good fit for the projects I've written and kind of approach them through email with a professionally formatted query letter and hope for the best. But uh, um, the selling your screenplay system has definitely been the most effective uh, system I've used so far. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, have you had some options or sales through any other means, which I guess would include these, these query letters that you're sending out? Yes, I actually have um, two other scripts. Um, one's a horror comedy and the other is kind of a fantasy, but, but not along these kind of Wonderland Narnia lines, more of something where fantasy invades the real world. I have two scripts like that. And, um, just kind of through like digging out, digging into the world and putting myself out there, I came in contact with, um, a group of financers who are working to kind of get that, those projects packaged and produced, and they seem really dedicated. So just through like, you know, uh, hitting the pavement so to speak but digitally through emails and on the internet i do have two other scripts that are floating out there that may hopefully go into production one day okay so. perfect and how do you typically track down the email addresses of these companies is it just straightforward as going to imdb pro yeah i i've looked for um for, i i look at films that have been made that are similar to, to what I'm writing. And I look at companies that might have a certain preference towards that who have produced, you know, multiple versions of these films. Then I definitely use IMDb Pro. I try to see if there's contact information to reach them. Another great resource is the, um, the Writers Guild of America website, okay. where they actually have a list of, um, you know, companies that might be interested in seeing submitted scripts and I've kind of gone through all that list multiple times for different scripts. Uh, you, you can also find forums out there, just screenwriting forums where writers are putting their heads together and sharing lists with each other of companies that will accept unsolicited scripts or scripts that are not represented yet and will review them. So I've just kind of been compiling my own like, you know, lists and, and, and little databases of, of companies that might be interested. And whenever I have a project that might fit them, I kind of consult my little list and mm -hmm. send it off to the prospective, you know, person that may hopefully be interested. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, where are you originally from? And, you know, where did you grow up and where did you go to college? And when did you move to LA? Okay. Um, I've been, I actually live in Orange County currently at the moment. Okay. But I go to LA, you know, constantly for meetings or just, things of that nature. I grew up in Orange County as well, and I went to college at the um, Cal State Dominguez Hills uh, School. Mm -hmm. um, I studied digital media production there, and we were required to take an internship. And luckily, I was able to land an internship at the Robert Evans Company at Paramount Pictures. And it was there nice. that I started to realize that my personal interests um, aligned more with the world of development and writing than, than actual production. I do short films and things like that. And I enjoy seeing production in general, because I think it's important to see like how the script operates on all sides of the industry, like how it, how it's written, how it's going to be interpreted by a director. But um, once I was at the Robert Evans company, they started to put me to work doing script coverage. They let me sit in on a couple meetings, uh, development meetings. I created lookbooks and promotional material for some of their projects. And I really just kind of, fell in love with the whole uh, process of, of just development. Mm -hmm. And how many, how long were you there and how many scripts do you think you read over that period? Oh, um, how many scripts? Probably not a hundred, but definitely in the tens. And it was actually a really great experience because their internships only go for three months. But even when mine was complete, they kept me on for a good long time. I believe I was there for eight months, just like learning the entire process because they just enjoyed having me around and there was even a period where they, uh, some of the producers went off to a uh, business meeting for a good amount of time over in Japan and just kind of let me hold down the fort for a while. Hmm. 
So those were all very good learning experiences. And, and, you know, I would have stayed there forever if they let me. But at one point we all realized, okay, we've stretched this three month, you know, (laughs) internship to a, to a very large point. We need to cut it off. And so, but it was a fantastic experience that pretty much put me on the path I am today. Yeah. So you read screenplays for the Selling Your Screenplay Script Analysis Service. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I guess first, um, how long have you been reading scripts for, for Selling Your Screenplay? Uh, for roughly about three years now. Okay. And let's talk about what we're trying to provide because I think that's a little bit, I think that's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, and it's definitely not what I would call typical coverage. Um, And so maybe you can talk about what you're trying to provide to the writer when you're approaching one of these analyses. Yeah, great. I, I, you know, I really admire the company selling your screenplay. I work for a bunch of different companies, but I find that with this one, I'm able to provide really accurate, helpful feedback without being urged to soften my approach or hold the writer's hand. Uh, This company definitely has a focus on the service of screenplay analysis and improvement, not just providing hollow praise and and false self-confidence to kind of get repeat customers. It Mm -hmm. really digs in and kind of, you know, like with a professionalism, we'll straight up tell the writer, you know, what needs to be fixed and very straightforward. And I really admire that approach. Yeah, yeah. And and what's funny is me and a buddy, as I was getting ready to launch this service, we sort of half-jokingly thought that through like gee i wonder if we should just create a service that just gives praise to people more people maybe would come back and continue to use that even if they didn't necessarily get a lot of value out of it and but no we you know i definitely took the opposite approach and i can tell there definitely have been some feathers ruffled um sometimes people are coming to our service expecting um as you say hollow praise but they're expecting their scripts to just get praised and and that's definitely not what we're trying to do here Oh, yeah. I think you absolutely took the right approach, because if you went the direction of, you know, urging the readers and the analysis to like, you know, just give hollow praise, th- that would make them feel good for, you know, that week or something. But then they would take their script, feel that it's ready for marketing, put it out there and not get any results. Yeah. I feel like even just having a few ruffled feathers, the long term benefits of, of what the writers are getting out of the service greatly outweigh any kind of like quick gratification that really doesn't have much substance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So maybe you can just talk briefly, are there some common mistakes that you see writers make over and over again? And maybe just, you know, two or three things that you see um, that you just wish writers wouldn't do? Sure. Um, it, here's a big one I've noticed recently, a big trend of it, and I don't know why. Um, I see, see a lot of writers where they have a really compelling premise and idea and I read it and, but their story, they don't embrace the premise and really kick the story in a high gear until the midpoint. Um, and a lot of scripts I've read recently have been plagued by this issue. Hmm. The writers will spend the first half of the script kind of introducing the premise and then embrace it and execute it around the midpoint. And it's really important to let the audience have insight into the core defining elements and conflicts of your script early on. If your story doesn't start until after the midpoint, then there's some structural issues you need to tackle. Yeah, for sure. You can't turn what you want to be your defining premise into a midpoint twist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sound advice if for you sure. t- if, Yeah, if, if you tell a producer that your script is about, you know, say a protagonist traveling back in time, and the producer reads the script, reaches the midpoint, and this promised event has not yet occurred, they'll feel misled and they'll most likely pass up on your script. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's important to kind of, you know, review the concept of narrative beats for a beginning writer, particularly the beat that's sometimes known as the big event. Mm-hmm. Or if you're a Blake Snyder or Save the Cat fan, the, breaks no, the beat's known as the break in a two and the promise of the premise. Yeah. If you can lock down and nail those beats at the correct position, then your premise will feel fully explored and it'll be the premise and not just a twist. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, no sound advice. And... um Another writer, I mean, another another issue I see is writers, particularly or exclusively those of spec scripts, stepping on the toes of cinematographers and directors a little too often, uh, mostly done through the writer, including unnecessary camera editing directions in an effort to make their script feel more immersive and complete. And it's important to remember that the screenwriter's job is to provide like a rough roadmap, not to actually drive the car. Mm-hmm. You always want to leave um, room in your work for future creative interpretation and input by potential future collaborators. This will make the script way more attractive if a director can look at it and and find their room in the script to put their own voice and perspective on it. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's excellent advice too. And I got one more if you want it. Yep, yeah, <laughs> fire away. Okay. Um, restraint. Um, just learning restraint in general. And this can apply to, you know, character count or just the event itself. Um, in terms of character count, I see a lot of scripts beginning with a large ensemble scene in which five or more characters are simultaneously introduced. And this makes the protagonist and their personal journey difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. Excessive character counts often result in characters having underdeveloped voices. There's just too many characters rotating through and sharing the spotlight where you can't really identify their niches in a good amount of time. Or characters become character luggage when they're carried from scene to scene and don't have much to do. And in terms of just structure and timeline, I see the lack of restraint really affecting biographical stories or dramas. Um, scripts attempting to cover 40 years of a character's life can come off as being somewhat episodic and disconnected. Mm -hmm. You could always rein it in and try to find if there's a particular time period in a character's life that could serve as a microcosm of their overall life and focus on that time period instead. A lot of writers are very passionate about their stories, but the passion sometimes causes the stories to become bloated and ineffective. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to apply restraint to, you know, using the phrase kill one's darlings and just boiling the script down to a lean, mean, functional story is always preferable to just kind of elaborate on every detail and just indulging oneself as you write. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so let's flip that question on its head. Are there some things that you see that you really like and you think writers should do more of? And maybe even using like a, a recent example of a film to kind of illustrate this might might be helpful for people. Sure. Um, I, I love genre films. So let, let's, let's take a a look at the recent film adaptation of Stephen King's It mm -hmm. and the concept of plot versus story, which is something I find a lot of new writers have difficulty wrapping their heads around. Um, this leads to many characters lacking a sense of evolution or identical uh, or I'll say this leads to many characters lacking a sense of evolution or an identifiable character arc. If there's not a good story to complement the plot. Mm -hmm. So looking at it, the plot is about a bunch of young children fighting for survival against a murderous Lovecraftian entity that takes the form of a clown. What's the story? The story is simple, but very effective. It's the story of a young boy, in this case, Bill, learning to accept the death of his brother. It's a story about growth and letting go. At the beginning, when the other characters discuss Georgie's death, Bill's quick to correct them by saying that Georgie isn't dead, he's only missing. Throughout the events, Bill grows as a person. He becomes braver, wiser. During his final face-to-face -face encounter with Pennywise, Pennywise assumes the form of Georgie, intent on using Bill's weaknesses and character flaws to make Bill vulnerable. But Bill overcomes his character issues and fulfills his arc as he tells Pennywise in the form of Georgie that he can't be Georgie because Georgie is dead. Mm -hmm. This allows Bill to gain the upper hand. It, it's a simple but highly effective character arc revolving around Bill moving past denial. It's consistently and progressively handled through the film. It's one of the things I noticed amongst all the like spectacle and horror in there. Mm -hmm. And you always have to make sure that your protagonist learns or grows somehow. When writing your script, determine their starting point. What's their flaws? Do they have a skewed perspective on life? Then look at the plot. How can this plot help them overcome these flaws? A character can also fail to fulfill a character arc. Tragedy and irony are, are awesome options. Mm -hmm. provided that the failure of the protagonist highlights some sort of cautionary thematic message to the audience. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's all excellent stuff. And um, maybe we'll have you back on and we can do a, even a deep dive into something like it. I'm curious, you said you love these genre films. Um, are there some specific types of films um, that you like? Do you gravitate more towards horror than, say, action or something like that? I do, but that also, I gravitate towards horror. Because, like I said, I, I kind of, as a side thing, my main passion is writing and development. But mm -hmm. me and a group of my college friends, we like to make short films here and there. And I, I like horror because it's, you know, for a beginning writer or a beginning filmmaker, it's horror is a very forgivable genre. If you make a horror film and there's some flaws in it, you know, you can see the, the, the seam or the zipper on the monster, so to speak, it makes the audience feel brave and it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, horror audiences are very forgiving towards flaws. Whereas other genres, it's, you know, they stand out and they can ruin the, um, the impression of the work as a whole a, a bit more. Yeah. So just 
for myself as, as a beginning filmmaker, I really gravitate towards horror because I find it's a great place to experiment. The community is really good. There's a, whenever a horror film has some flaws, it actually interjects a little bit of just extra fun. And the audience feels a little braver and smarter than the story. And so it's just a great genre to cut one's teeth on. And that, that's something to also remember, you know, you might have, you might be just starting off and you might have an idea that's a bit of a silly horror idea and then an incredibly deep, you know, affecting drama. Mm -hmm. It might be good to work on that horror film first because there's a little bit more wiggle room within that genre. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so now you have this, uh, this recent option through the Selling Your Screenplay database. What is next for you? What are you kind of strategizing in terms of advancing your own career as a writer? Um, more writing, writing, writing. The, uh, the, the option was fantastic and a bit unexpected, and it made me sit back and... That is, I consider that kind of the best script I've written. Like I said, I've given it polish throughout the years. I've made a little routine of revisiting and around Halloween. And, and so once that one is, you know, currently spoken for, I kind of sat back and went, oh, wow, someone picked up what I consider my best script. Oh, I, I better make a new best script. Mm -hmm. So it was actually very creatively invigorating. Like, you know, ever since it's happened, I've just been brainstorming more and working on new projects. So I guess that also ties in, ties in the idea of like, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, I'm not going to completely rely on this and call this a victory and just sit back and say, oh, well, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Time to just wait and hope for good things to happen. It's time to set up the next option and just try to, you know, put more things out there in the world. And the more things you have out there floating around, the, the more your chance increase that one of them will potentially go into production. Yeah, sound advice for sure. I always like to um, wrap up the question just by asking the guests how people can kind of keep up with what you're doing. Anything you're comfortable sharing, a Twitter handle, Facebook page, blog, whatever you um, don't mind sharing with the audience. Maybe people will just kind of follow that and learn more about you. Um, we actually, me and my college friends, we have a little uh, YouTube page that's called Gargoyle Media. That's the name of the channel, like the creature Gargoyle Media. And like I said, we're just kind of cutting our teeth on the horror genre. A lot of the stuff on there <clears throat> is very rough around the edges, mm -hmm. but it's everything is a learning experience. And every little silly project we've done from the ones where we try really hard to the ones where like it's been very casual and relaxed, there's always something new to learn. Every project has taught us something different about writing, about, you know, lighting on the production side, about just everything. So, you know. Um, people are free to check that out. It's a uh, little rough. It's just kind of just some things we've kind of done on the side to further our own various crafts. They're in more into production. I'm more into development. Yep, yep. But so, uh, yeah. Perfect. And I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, so last question, what have you been watching recently that you thought was really great? And I like to just keep that, you know, maybe something on Netflix or a movie that's currently out, something that people could potentially go and easily see. Um, what have you seen lately that you really liked? Oh, once again, touching on genre stuff, I actually just started uh, The Punisher on Netflix. Hmm. Okay. And I'm only on episode two, so, you know, my opinion of, of the series as a whole could change. Uh -huh. But I am a Marvel fan, so it probably won't. Uh -huh. But um, I really like what I'm seeing so far, especially in episode two. I won't include any spoilers, but there's some great kind of upending of expectations in regards to, like, hero and villain and how you would expect their interactions to go. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I really like how they've taken what people would expect, like, you know, an encounter between like a hero and villain, turned it on its head and and used that kind of upending of expectations to really kind of solidify the defining factors of the hero himself. And just I really like what I see so far. It's kind of, you know, the second episode kind of set me for a loop where I was like, oh, I didn't expect it to go this way so quickly. That's interesting. So, yeah, oh. everybody should check that out. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Steve, as always, I just appreciate talking with you and um, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me on the podcast episode. Thank you. This was a very awesome experience for me. I very much appreciate being here. Perfect. Steve, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 
a quick plug for the SYS screenwriting analysis service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. So for instance, if you think Steve, who you just heard me interview, would be a good fit for your screenplay, you can choose him as your reader. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade, a pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also so look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline synopsis service to an analysis or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or gets a consider from one of our readers, you get to list your screenplay in the new SYS Select database which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of what SYS Select Program is all about. Again, you just heard Steve talk about his experience optioning a script through it. As further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our service. This monthly newsletter goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. These producers are hungry for material and getting recommendations from us is something that they really enjoy getting because the scripts have already been, already been vetted. So most of the time when a script gets on this list, it will get at least a handful of downloads and a handful of reads from, from qualified producers. So again, it's just another great way to get your material out there. If you want a professional, so if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Just a quick shout out to screenwriter Christian Lactus who used the SYS email and fax blast service a few months back. He met a producer through this blast and optioned a script to him. He is a Canadian writer so it's nice to see some people far from Hollywood having some success in the business. So congratulations Christian, this is fantastic. I added a little blurb about his option to the SYS select success page. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, just check that out. And that's at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer, director, Susan Walter, who recently did a film called All I Wish, starring Sharon Stone. We get into great detail about how she made this movie come together, how she got everything going, how she was able to raise money, how she wrote the script, and also we talk a little bit about how she was able to land Sharon Stone for the lead in the film. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Steve. He great, gave some great tactical tips as a reader, so really listen to those. Steve is on the front lines of reviewing screenplays from screenwriters trying to break into the business. So he sees a lot of scripts that have sort of the same problems over and over again. So I'd really encourage you to listen to his tips and see if they might be something that could help you with your writing. I also really like Steve's answer to my question, now that you got an option screenplay, what's next? And you know his answer was spot on and it was something to the effect of, I'm just gonna keep writing more material. I mean, this is the correct answer in this situation. I remember when I first moved to Hollywood, um, I started working at a tennis club in Toluca Lake and um, you know there were tons of other writers and actors and stuff working there and I was getting to know some of these people and um, so many of them had these stories of oh my screenplay is at such and such an agent or it's at su it's such and such an actor is looking at it or such and such a director and I was always like you know wow that's fantastic I mean I was new to town and so this was really impressive to me um, you know whether they had an option or they had an actor looking at it or whatever the case some sort of very small little bit of success and again just being new to town this was very impressive to me um, but then as time went on I'd ask follow-up questions so how's it going with such and such an actor and they'd just always be like oh I haven't quite heard back yet but any day now um, and this would go on pretty much forever and 
The worst part about all of this was that these writers, for the most part, they were simply waiting to hear back from, you know, such and such director, such and such actor. And they were using this potential option or I guess potential even a sale as a way of avoiding having to write more material. They weren't really doing anything. They were just waiting. And I think that's the worst thing you can do for your career. I mean, it's only human to get excited when you get some success and having a solid read or getting an option, any kind of minor success. You definitely want to celebrate those moments and those are exciting. Um, but the fact of the matter is a lot of them, the vast majority of these small successes aren't going to turn into anything. Um, so, you know, by all means, get excited, but then get back to work as quickly as you can. And I think Steve pretty much summed it up in this interview. So hopefully you really listen to that. And as you progress in your own career and start to get some of these options, um, you will realize that, um, you know, you really need to keep keep moving forward because there's a good chance the option isn't going to turn into anything. So once again, if you want to have your screenplays read by Steve, check out sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Um, you can find him there on that page. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.